Hello, 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 and welcome to the show. So we are late. Basically, Port India has some pretty big tech issues. So we were waiting. I was waiting for them to be solved. And then I realized I just couldn't just keep everyone waiting indefinitely because it's rude. So what I'm going to do is risk it with India um, because um, they're, she's now messing around basically with some technology, which is, we've all been there. Don't worry about it. We can, we can do this. So... Hopefully, she will solve that. In the meanwhile, you've got me. We'll talk about this. Very important we talk about, we've got two very big things we're talking about today. Um, later on, we're going to be talking about very, very, very exciting news, which is very, very close to my heart indeed, which is the results of the four-day week pilot. Now, many of you, you may may have heard of it or may not have heard of it. Basically, it's an experiment um, which several businesses um, uh, signed up to. Um, which uh, where a load of businesses basically agreed to cut down by a fifth, generally to a four day week for their workers um, over a period of time to see the results. And the results are in and they are absolutely brilliant. They show everything from um, productivity going up, revenue going up, um, staff uh, retention going up. Uh, I mean, it's just lo- mental well-being going up. Um, it really is a tremendous success. I think it really is one of the great ideas of our time, which several, um, you know, these businesses have signed up to. Ninety-two percent of the businesses participating are going uh, to stick, uh, going to stick with a four-day week. So it's very, very exciting. I'm excited, and I hope you're excited as well. What we're going to be talking about shortly with India, um, and we're going to experiment with some technology. See what happens. Whatever happens, whatever happens, we can hear her when we have her on. And that's what's important. Um, but this is a really, really important thing we need to talk about, indeed, to say the least. So a some letters have been sent uh, claiming to be from the London Cell of National Action, a neo-Nazi group which was actually banned by the British government back in 2016, both to India, Willoughby, um, who is a prominent trans writer, um, and bro- sorry, trans bro- broadcaster and activist, and also someone else we've had repeatedly on this channel, Dr. Shola Moz Shogbamimu. Um, now, the far right is growing in this country and it has been emboldened by the British media, by the Conservatives and by various extreme activists. So it's very important that we talk about that. So I'll bring India in shortly. Um, if you're watching live, do press the YouTube link and press like and subscribe. Um, you can interact in the show and support the show by using Super Chats on YouTube. And I will um, read through everyone's comments. Well, everyone's at the end of thank you, but I will put the comments to the guests, including on the four-day week later. Uh, or you can support us on patreon.com forward slash Owen Jones 84, which keeps the show on the road. I'm going to bring in India. Hey, India, I don't think we can see you, India, but we can hear, we can hear you, can't we? <laughs> Well, 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 the thing is, Owen, it kind of adds in a flippant way to the Salman Rushdie situation that we're in, where I'm, where I'm blanked out, and maybe it's a good thing that nobody uh, gets any clues from where I am. So maybe I'm... we'll we'll pretend that this is part <laughs> of your, of your protection. Yeah. Uh, I think we can hear you clearly, though. I don't know. Maybe you can move. Is it closer to the mic, just so we can hear your? Yeah, voice. I can move close. I no worries. Is that yeah, better? Well, that's much better. It's just because we can't, we can't, we can't see you, but we can't. Yeah, yeah, that's you. cool. Yeah, India. Let's just talk about this. So we, you, I've talked obviously about just briefly what's happened. Can you just tell me what happened? What is this letter which um, has been? And firstly, by the way, should have said at the outset, love and solidarity. Um, Thank always. you. Absolutely horrified when I heard about it. Very, very distressed to read about both you and and Shola as well. Mm. Could you could you just tell me about the letter? Yeah, sure. So yesterday was just a normal day for me. I was going about my business. And then uh, the middle of the afternoon, I got a call from my accountant. Um, I thought it was just a tax matter as we're at that time of year. Um, but three or four words into what he was saying, um, I could tell something was wrong. And he was really um, shook and uh, disturbed by what had happened. And what happened was um, somebody had delivered, hand delivered a letter to his place of work addressed to me, um, which he opened. And he said it was like something from a horror slasher movie, um, full of the worst 
stuff that he'd ever ever read. He couldn't believe it. So mm. he 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 was alarmed himself that somebody had actually turned up at his um, address, and he was checking with me whether I wanted to contact the police because he felt it was so bad that I had to do it. So I said absolutely to, to do that. Um, he, he didn't want to pass the letter on to me directly. He said, it's, it's too shocking. It's going <laughs> to freak you out. So I said, fine, I'm going to take your judgment on that. That's great. Um, and then lo and behold, I found out by going on social media um, that Shola had had the same situation, a hand delivered letter. So since then, um, it's been a, a day occupied by calls and visits from the police. Obviously, it's a serious uh, investigation now. The police have looked at it. They say it's a credible threat because mm. of the organisation that's involved and the history that this um, particular group have, most notably Joe Cox, that they were linked uh, to that incident. Um, so they're treating it extremely seriously. I've got to be quite careful about um, what, I, what I say uh, as to where I am and, and what's actually happened. But they have, um, they've spent the day checking out where I am at the moment, m making sure it's secure. They're taking measures, they're taking steps. Um, and it's scary, Owen, genuinely mm -hmm. scary. I've had death threats before. I'm sure you have because mm -hmm. of the nature of what you do mm -hmm. online. But they're normally from Bob6976 or Vera, three double, wherever. And you can knock them away. There's no credibility behind them. Just dismiss them. It's somebody saying stupid things in the spur of the moment. But in this instance, uh, and the same with Shola, uh, Shola they, they've actually taken time out to compose individual letters. Shola's mm -hmm. was very specifically about race. Mine mm. was specifically about trans. Um, they've taken time out to f try and find my address. Fortunately for me, I don't have my address anywhere. The, the closest they could get was by going to company's house and, um, and finding an address that way of somebody connected to me. Um, and then on top of that, they've put the energy and effort into either themselves delivering it by hand or finding a, arranging for a courier or a third party to go to the, the address and deliver it by hand. So this, it's, it's not something casual. It's something that's organized and there's effort behind it. And I have to say, I, I did read um, Shola, the letter sent to Shola, which was posted on Twitter, and it was really, really, really shocking. Yeah, um, dreadful. Yeah, absolutely dreadful. I'll just, yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm not not alone myself from receiving lots of death threats, but there's something specifically chilling about this yeah. uh, and the way it was written. Um, it was very, very disturbing, talking about, an ex like, we will execute you and mm. so on. And as you mentioned, we do have a history of far right violence in this country. Joe Cox, as you mentioned, Rosie Cooper, another Labour MP, who there was a far right terrorist plot to murder her with a machete. Um, we had a number of far right terror plots which which have been foiled. The biggest increase in terror plots are coming from the far right. So this is obviously very disturbing. I mean, just look on a human level. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm really shook up by it. Um, you know, I've. I, I... I've, I'm, I'm used to the argy bargy of, of Twitter and, you know, the dreadful things, which has, even for Twitter, which has never been the greatest environment, that has just gone off a cliff um, as far as I'm concerned in the last couple of months. It's like the handbrake is off and literally any, anything goes. So, yeah, I'm definitely um, disturbed by it. Um, you know, I haven't been out the house today because I've been dealing with... Um, various things that the the counter-terrorist unit are advising on um but i'm i'm really worried <laughs> for the first time um and i don't know about you owen i think there's been a palpable change in the climate recently mm. you can yeah. almost feel it and i know that that was that will sound strange to people who aren't in the midst of these types of arguments um but it's a, a feeling of foreboding that something really bad 
is going to happen. And there, there is going to come a time when all of these people who are continually ratcheting up um, hateful rhetoric, where they're demonizing um, trans people, a tiny portion of the population, 0.2%, mm. there is coming a time when there, there will be um, a day of culpability where mm. they're trying desperately at the moment to just distance themselves initially from that, the tragedy of Brianna um, Guy who, that happened a couple of weeks ago. She's the British trans girl who was murdered. Um, so they're doing their best to put clear blue water between themselves. Nothing. All we all we're doing is saying that we uh, that trans people are a threat. Uh, we're not saying go out and murder people. It's nothing to do with us, which is absolute baloney. Um, and now, in the light of this threat, I, I can't, looking at Twitter today, <laughs> briefly, I, the response from the gender critical people hasn't been, um, we're so sorry to hear this. The, the response from the gender critical movement has been, you're a liar. You didn't receive this letter. It never mm. happened. Mm. You're making it up. You're trying mm. to jump on shoulders. I've had the counter-terrorist people here today. Mm. The counter-terrorist people have issued a statement mentioning the transphobic letter that's been sent to me. They still will not believe it, Owen. It's mm. literally that they are in such a frenzy that you can't cut through anymore. Yeah, I mean, that I think it says its own story, really. I mean, we're talking about obviously an extremely radicalised movement who have obviously particularly fixated with trans people in the public eye um, who they've systematically tried to drive from public life um, and have succeeded in, frankly, mm -hmm. driving lots of trans people from the public sphere. Um, I mean, I mean, that's the, one of the other points, you know, one of the things I want to talk to you about, because obviously, specifically, we know neo-Nazis here are directly responsible. OK, and yeah. we're obviously very clear about that. But there's a broader question of who who is who is helping to radicalize yeah. and legitimize these extremists. When we talk about Islamist extremists, people go, well, who are the hate preachers who radicalize them, et cetera, et cetera. With the far right, we have obviously you've got the far right, but you have a broader ecosystem where you get rhetoric which targets historically very vulnerable minorities who are the receiving end of bigotry and legitimizes bigotry and hatred towards them. So is your point really here? that what's happened is because of the hysteria whipped up about the existence of a very small minority in British society, trans people, that is helping to fuel what has happened here in terms of this very specific and very chilling threat towards you. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, I, I, I made a tweet yesterday um, listing who I feel is uh, responsible for what's happened to me this week and is, is happening to the trans community as a whole. And that most definitely is um, the British media, the government, and the gender critical movement. And the, the particular thing that I find about trans hate is it's, it's, it's not swear words, it's not um, necessarily <laughs> aggressive stuff. It's, it's mainly done by a very middle class type of person mm -hmm. who's quite articulate. And because it's said often in a very calm, measured way, they're intellectualizing bigotry. And I think a lot of people don't see that because it's, it's given this veneer of respectability, you know, what is a woman? Um, I mean, if you said, what is a black man or what is a black woman? And you started delving in to, you know, really graphic details about the way they talk about trans bodies is just disgusting. They, they wouldn't talk that way about anyone else. And I think what's happening on a, on a wider level is that all these little um, um, movements, not just necessarily um, trans people, I'm talking, um, you know, obviously about the black community as well. You've got mm -hmm. um, asylum seekers as well. Mm -hmm. They are all kind of anti-Semitism as well, which there's a massive crossover between uh, transphobic people and anti-Semites. They're, they're now all kind of, coalescing into one group. If you go on to somebody who's given you abuse on, on Twitter, I, I find that before you check their profile, you will kind of know that they're, go they're going to be into the anti-vax 
um, type of argument that they're going to be hostile to asylum seekers mm -hmm. as well. And I think the responsibility for that, the, the actual, when you boil it all down to the nitty gritty, these are all types of people who are digesting the sort of media that you get on the likes of GB News, Talk TV, where it's just a full day of what they class as free speech in finger little speech marks, uh, where it's people coming on ranting against vulnerable people. And it it's, it's almost like supporting a football team. You, mm. If you're part of GB News, you're part of Talk TV, then these are the things that you subscribe to. And I think that is the, the worrying thing. And, and for me, that's the very reason why a lot of organized far-right groups have focused in on trans. It's a very easy thing to use as a wedge mm. topic because on the surface of it, if you use language such as, well, do you agree with biological males in um, women's mm. changing rooms? Of course, 99% of the population, me included, are going to say, no, I don't want biological males in the thing, because that's the level that they're thinking of. They're not thinking about the nuance or the, the layers underneath, which then they gradually descend down to. So ugh, it, it's a scary time. I've never felt like this in my lifetime. I lived under Thatcher. Um, I was talking to this with a friend yesterday. I never thought there would be anyone ever as bad as Maggie Thatcher. Um, but I think it's scarier now. And I think that's down to the internet as well, social media, the way that it, it's being amplified. It's, it's constant. It's not like the old days where you used to have to buy a newspaper or you would wait for the one of three news bulletins a day. This is constantly being pumped out. Mm. on multiple platforms you cannot escape it even if you want to india i mean just it really is horrifying to hear really yeah. really really disturbed and feel nothing but obviously admiration for the way you've you've spoken out after yeah well can i just say th thank you very much i mean owen kudos to you you're just about the only journalist in britain at the moment um that's sticking up for for trans people which is a very lonely thing and i'm sure that's you know well i know it's not because i see your, your twitter feed obviously you're getting in um a lot of flack for it as well so but thank you for that no 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 i mean obviously i mean the, the, you know the reality is you know i mean i, I appreciate that obviously but I, I, I think it's tragic that we've got to a situation in this country where <laughs> just the very act of standing in solidarity with trans people is seen as some sort of extreme or subversive act. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I shouldn't deserve a cookie for that. It should just be like accepted as a given. Mm. Um, and I'm sorry that the British media in this country is an absolute burning skip when it comes to this specific yeah. issue and, you know, the, the impact this has, and this is what they, they did do this to gay and bi people in the 1980s yeah. and 1990s in a big, big way. And it is a rerun of that. Um, and it is very, very chilling because at the moment we've got a bigger far right than we did back then. So a lot of these are feeding into the far right. I've had my own dealings with the far right. Mm. I got attacked by the Nazi yeah. on my birthday in 2019. Um, and, you know, I very much blame the kind of radicalization um, which right wing media outlets and all the rest fed yeah. at that time. And the same goes here. Um, I really, but honestly, Eddie, we're, we're, we'll. <laughs> you have huge numbers of people behind you and there are many of us who will stand by trans people to the very, very end. And, um, you know, it's very important. I say that I can just hear David Baratta listening to this is scary as hell. I worry for you both. How much of a role has the American far right and right wing organizations had in the U S in the rise of the far right here, turning point heritage, for instance, a really good point. Actually a lot yeah. of that, you know, you've got this ecosystem in the U S where they have huge amounts of money and they throw money at, you know, very, you know including at things like GB news to be, to, yeah. to be honest with you. Uh, Tad Campwell says, love and respect to India and people in danger from the far right. Very, very important. Um, love and solidarity and um, really appreciate you coming on at very short notice, India. We did, we yeah, just we started sure. to do this about three hours ago, so I really appreciate <laughs> you coming on. Yeah, no worries. All right, Owen. Take care. Lots of love. Take care. Speak Thank soon. Thank you. Have a good Take night. Care. See you now. Bye. Okay. Bye. Um, great for India to, to to join us there. Really, really appreciate it. And I can see lots of the comments there in terms of people showing that love and solidarity, which is very, very important. Um, do press. Um, I know we did this. Not only did we do this show at very short notice, which for there were reasons. I couldn't do the show on Sunday, basically. Um, and then I was trying to find a time to do a live show. And then I could only do it now. 
Uh, so I could, I had about four hours to, <laughs> and I didn't realize my good friends, Navara, I forgot, have now a show on Tuesday, which they've got on at six o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So it could have been organized a little bit better, but um, we don't normally do lives during the week, but we are where we are. I'm glad we did it. Um, I'm going to bring in now Jack Kellum from the four day week campaign. And this is uh, off the back of this uh, trial, a major four day week trial shows most companies see massive staff mental health benefits and profit increase. So the four day week, for those who don't know, Jack, sum it up. What is this? So it is a move from a 40 hour week to a 32 hour week, but crucially is about any loss in pay. So people's pay remains the same, but they lose a day's worth of work. That might be a single day. So it might be a Friday or a Monday, but there are also other models of doing it. So you could do five shorter days and other alternatives as well. But yes, yeah, reduction in time, no reduction in pay. How's it gone? It's been great. It's been really, really successful. So this was one of the largest uh, trials of a four-day week, working week to date, which took place in the UK. We had around 61 companies involved from a range of sectors. So not just office workers. We had like a brewery, a fish and chip shop, uh, a housing association, uh, care care companies. So it was a really broad range of organisations took part. We saw not only some really imp um, significant improvements to workers' well-being <laughs> and mental health, so burnout decreased, stress decreased, sleep problems came down, life satisfaction went up, but also you know, the companies themselves seemed to do quite well out of it too. So revenue uh, improved against the comparison period um, prior to the trial, and resignations of staff also dropped as well. So it was a bit of a win-win for both workers involved and the businesses too. So, I mean, what, I mean, this was a pilot, obviously, with lots and lots of companies uh, signed up. But the vast majority of companies haven't, you know, they're still not signing up to this. Why? Why, why if it's such a success, what, what's the issue? I mean, I think on one hand, there is definitely growing interest. I think in the last two years since COVID, particularly when there was a big changes experience in the world of work, I think people, you know, people have desired shorter hours for a long time. People know they're overworked. They know it's not the most efficient way of working. But there's a realisation now that we can make these changes to the way we work. Our working practices aren't set in stone. They're things we can determine ourselves. However, I think, you know, there is still um, an overwhelming sort of uh, inbuilt ideology around work that we have, in which we presume that, you know, working longer is working better and producing more. And there's a sort of work ethic that's quite deeply ingrained in a lot of companies. Um, so I think that, 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 that still breeds a bit of resistance to the idea, but we are seeing now, we are seeing increasing interest in short working hours sort of across the board, um, and more and more companies are definitely becoming interested in it. So tell us about, in terms of this pilot, in terms of, say, mental well-being, what, what did the evidence base suggest happened to people's mental well-being? So... Um, this uh, this pilot scheme was really uh, really interesting because we were able to use researchers from the University of Cambridge and Boston College as well. They collected a range of data, so it wasn't just uh, quantitative data, but it was important. So collecting before and after a trial uh, figures on uh, people's mental mental well being and uh, um, mental and physical health. But it was also a range of interviews and quality data too to get a really deep sense of how this affected people. So I think you know, there's a range of ways that people seem uh, to find a benefit of shorter working hours. I think one of the ones that comes up time and time again, whether it's this study or previous ones, is you know, um, it, it, it's it's being able to spend time with people who are important to you, particularly parents of kids. I think they find that extra bit of time is a, makes a huge difference, both for the you know the sort of admin, <laughs> for a better word, of taking kids. Around, but also just spending quality time with them or people with caring responsibilities for other people too. There's this knock-on effect, which I think has a really, we saw had a really powerful effect on um, how people saw their uh, mental health over the course of the trial. In terms of, so the, the very important point about no loss of pay. So, because that's the fear people have. They hear, oh, I'd love to work less, but I'll, I'll you know, lose pay. How then people go, well, how is it afforded? That's one of the things people come into, go into people's heads. Yeah, of course. And that's a really good question. So, and, and, and it does it does run against lots of our common sense uh, understanding of how work um, plays out, right? We often assume that there's a direct correlation between how long we work and how much work we get done. I think through the four-day week um, uh, pilot schemes we're seeing around the world, we're, we're being able to increasingly pull this apart. So people are able to be more productive in a short amount of time and do the same amount as they did before. That's because they're less burnt out, they're less stressed. And also, you know, companies going into this trial, they often take on a review of their working practices. They sort of look together collectively. And the ones who did it best were often those that re-involved their workers and gave them agency to make these changes, right, and sort of how they were going to improve the work, um, working environment. Because often, you know, people have really good ideas about 
uh, their, their, their ways of working, how to make these changes. So they were able to make make up that uh, um, make up that amount, that amount of work in the shorter period of time that they're in in place. But it is an important point, though. It is important going forward now, as we see the four-day week spread. It, we, we want to make sure it remains a four-day working week for no loss in pay. That's why it's going to be really important to see more politicians, campaigners, trade unions really get on board with this to make sure you know, it, the four-day working week means a four-day week for the same amount of pay. One of the things that was put to me about it when I, I visited a company taking part um, in the pilot, and, and one of the points they made is actually on a Friday, a lot of basically Friday afternoons are right off. <laughs> Um, they basically pe people's productivity just collapses. So actually, in the end, you've kind of like there's only like half a day on Friday anyway, uh, mm. where people are kind of really being productive. Would you? Would you? So in, in a set, do you see what I mean? It's kind of like yeah. a lot of people. It's this idea of um, uh, presenteeism that your you people are just there for the sake of it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, I think a lot of people will find us familiar with jobs that they've worked maybe currently or in the past, and they're aware that you know a lot of the time people are in offices because you know there's a sort of there's that expectation you can't be the first one to go home so you're there not doing anything particularly productive but everyone's still there finding bits to do um and, sp and spreading the time out to, you know to avoid being the first person going home and there's so many of these other sort of uh themes that people have experienced i'm sure in their working lives which yeah, mean that there's there's so much time that could be better spent if we got away from this particular um, work ethic of being in the office or being uh, active on uh, Slack or you know other workplace apps, right? And so I think you know it, it, what's interesting is the fact that the transition to remote working hasn't necessarily changed in the first part. In fact, if anything, it's made it worse. So I think that's going to be something interesting going forward as well. Is you know making sure that a four-day week means a four-day week, and that's why we need other policies alongside it, like um, something like a right to disconnect, right? So it's the idea that. Uh, outside of your contracted working hours, you don't have to respond to workplace communications. So people are actually able to make sure they get that disconnect from their work and get that uh, time that they're not contracted to. One of the points was also put to me was um, childcare is very expensive in this country. So as well as a low loss of pay, some people found that they could, for example, if they have a kid, they could spend time with their kid on a Friday and actually they'd save hundreds of pounds on childcare. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've done calculations in the past, autonomy on um, the, the, the financial effects of moving a four-day four working week on things like childcare, commuting as well is another big knock-on effect too, right? Which would make a big difference if people were, were working less, given especially how, how costly childcare is at the moment. So I think, you know, parents or those with like uh, extensive caring responsibilities, a four-day week, working week is a really uh, attractive option. Um, and yeah, there's, a, there's this whole knock-on set of effects, I think, that a 4-day week can have. You know, we've seen as well, in the past, we've been involved in research which has shown the sort of environmental effects that a 4-day working week would have as well, right? So if you're thinking about cutting down on the commuting to the office, the overheads are involved, and just generally freeing up more time for a slightly slower pace of life, right? Maybe you spend the time to cook a slightly more sustainable uh, meal than buying a pack ready package stuff, and all of this thing knocks on. Right? There's a lot of knock-on effects from a four-day working week, which could be really, really positive. But some might think, well, some types of work isn't compatible with this model, that, you know, yet mm. things have to be done on a Friday in some places. Yeah, so that's that's, that's, that's definitely a fair fair question to ask, I think. So on the one hand, there's like the, the, the easy answer to this, which is that, you know, in lots of these company, uh, companies who needed to stay open Monday to Friday, they stayed open Monday to Friday and staggered it amongst staff, right? So... Some people work Monday to Thursday, some work Tuesday to Friday, et cetera. In a broader question, um, I guess we do need to ask questions about how we could transfer this to um, sectors of the economy where it's less obvious that you could condense work into a short period of time, right? So that might be something like the NHS or uh, the education sector and schools and so on. Where, let's be honest, you know, shorter working hours are needed as much as anywhere in most places. We know the effects of overwork um, on uh, on workers, on teachers, on doctors. That's as much, I think, behind some of the issues at the moment and the strikes we're seeing. However, yeah, we have to really think about how we can transition to a four-day working week in these places too. And in most places, you know, you're not just gonna be able to do it with the same amount of staff, right? You're gonna need to increase the number of essentially doctors, teachers we have. And look, that's a bold, ambitious policy you know, that would require substantial investment in our health service, our education sector. That is just what we need. It's a chance to really you know, upgrade, not just our NHS and our schools, but you know, our, our economy as a whole, right? So I think we need to try to keep, keep this conversation going on and see it being really picked up, I think, by 
like I said, politicians, trade unions, and so on, to make sure that you know other workers don't lose out uh, on the four-day working week. We know that it's needed across the economy, across the workforce. Mm. So let's find out, let's work this strategy to make uh, make this a reality. So finally, do you think off the back of this pilot, other companies are they going to sign up? And how do you, how do you encourage people to get their place of work and sign up to it? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're already seeing lots of lots of interest in making this shift to a four day uh, four day working week from UK companies. Even today, people sort of getting in touch. So, uh, four day work, four day week campaign and a sort of autonomy. We'll be running a rollout program this year for organisations who are involved. So you can go to a four day weeks website to autonomy's website and find details there too. Um, and yeah, I mean, but lots of places are doing it of their own accord as well. We keep hearing about people who've made this transition to shorter working hours, and um, you yeah, know, it's it's something which people have found as a real. Uh, uh, real, real benefit to workers in particular, right? So we've seen, um, so it's, it's, seen, it's seen some really positive developments over the last couple of years. Brilliant stuff, Jack. Very, very inspiring and very exciting. I really do think it's one of the great ideas of our time. And in the hellscape in which we live, it's good to have positive <laughs> things, which... So you're a life raft, is what I'm yes. trying to tell you. No pressure. Better, better things are possible, for sure. <laughs> it can happen. Cheers, Jack. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us on AC. And, uh, and fingers crossed... This spreads like wildfire. Cheers. Thanks, Owen. Cheers. Really great stuff. Very, very exciting stuff. Uh, yeah, I visited a brilliant games company, which do the four-day week. Um, and I'm going to humble brag now because I met the chief executive. It's quite a bit. It's like I've got 50 employees. And um, he said, yeah, he read an article which encouraged him to do it. And then he looked through his emails and the article was actually written by me. So if I've made no impact in the world, I've got one impact, which was to reduce the working week. Um, of a games company so you know i'll, I'll take it uh, it is very exciting though i'm very excited about it i've written an entire chapter on it for my new book which is coming out next year the alternative and how we build it that has finally been written so we'll see uh hopefully see that soon but yeah um it is one of the great exciting things which is going on at the moment so i think we need to we need to talk more about positive stuff um given as i've said where we're at um some people were mentioning my orange hoodie, I noticed. So just to be clear what the orange hoodie is, it is my favourite hoodie at the moment, but it is for the independent workers of Great Britain. It's a trade union which organises migrant and precarious workers. So do check them out. But it's not very good, I suppose, for free advertising for that particular union because you can't see the logo. <laughs> so it's just me wearing an orange hoodie. But what the hell? It's I think it sees me, but I was trying to make a... It's trying to, it's like a show of solidarity. It raised, I bought it and then it raised money for them. Um, just quickly, because I spoke, I did, I mean, we did this very impromptu. I'm sorry, guys. Just, you know, I didn't do a live this week, so I wanted to do one and this is when we did it. Um, but on that, we, I did um, a video today about Kate Forbes and her collapsing leadership campaign, which really has been collapsing ever since. I, I know where this is now heading because I can see the kind of, well, firstly, you had people going, oh, it's bullying, it's bullying. Politicians need to stop being able to claim that scrutiny of them is bullying because that is definitely something which has been picked up over the last few years. Let's be honest, it happened under Corbynism. And it includes people having, frankly, opinions about vulnerable and marginalised minorities and being scrutinised about them and then claiming that they're the victims and they're the ones being bullied. So to be clear, for those who don't know, Kate Forbes is standing to be Nicola Sturgeon's successor and she has a load of very, very reactionary opinions on gay rights, on abortion rights, on trans rights, and on sex outside of marriage. Ludicrous. Now, what this is now heading is people are going, oh, people of faith are being banned from politics. No, they're not. Lots of religious people in politics. Most Scottish Christians support equal rights uh, for gay people. They support equal marriage. So you can't, it's, it's insulting to Christians uh, to make that argument because that's not the mainstream Christian argument or the mainstream argument that Christians have in this country. Um. And, you know, you know, there's other point where we're going, oh, well, you know, those people of that particular kind of depth of faith will be, you know, banned from politics. And where this is basically heading is that the me that the horrible, mean minorities are going to force people out of politics. They're silencing people, all the rest of it. That isn't happening. What is happening is because of the activism and struggle, yes, of, for example, LGBTQ people, People's attitudes have changed. That's what's happened. And there has become a broad consensus, not on all LGBTQ stuff, on trans people there clearly isn't at all, but on, on say, equal marriage for gay people that is, or, and bi people, that is, that's an accepted thing. There's a consensus over that particular issue. But more to the point, within 
parties which style themselves as being socially progressive. Um, she, I mean, you can't stand realistically for the leadership of that party with those ideas. You could for another party, you could find another party which opposes equal marriage and you'll do well. But you don't have a right. It's not enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights to be the leader of a political party. That isn't the right of a citizen. That, that is only something you can get if the members of that party place your tr their trust in you. And if they decide that your values contradict their own, they're not going to vote for you. That isn't an attack on your human rights. That's not an attack on, on, on your freedom. You know, you don't, you can still go off and you can still hold these views. You're not going to go to prison. No one's going to lock you up. A lot of people are just going to go, I don't like your opinions. They're bad. And I think they show that, you know, basically you don't accept the equality of LGBTQ people. You've made a call. We're going to make a call. We ain't voting for you. It's annoying. It's just this whole thing just always degenerates into kind of like, you know, oh, this is cancel culture. This is cancel culture. People sort of say, is she not entitled to her opinion? Just stop getting offended and just agree, disagree with her. People are disagreeing with her and they're not going to vote for her. That's the point. She's not been cancelled. She's not under attack. She's a politician. And what happens with, in a democracy, I'm sorry to have to describe, to explain what democracy is to people in the comments. In a democracy, you see, what happens is politicians can have views but people can disagree with them and scrutinize them and say they're not suitable for high office. That's how democracy works. But some people think, seem to think that free speech means you can say what you want and nobody can respond to you. That, that, I mean, that's, that, I mean, it doesn't work for freedom of expression there because you're saying that other people don't have the right to say what they think about other people. People have the right to say, I think your views are toxic. I think your views are bigoted. People have the right to say that. Now, if on the back of that, they decide not to vote for you, that's their call. What, what are you going to do about it? Force people at gunpoint to vote for people? I don't think so. That's why she's not going to become leader of the SNP, because it's not a hard right political party. The view she's expressing, you would ex expect in a, in a very right wing, socially, very conservative political party. But whatever you think about the SNP, it is a bit of a hodgepodge because they only really agree in independence. And as we can see, They've got quite a lot of... Dive She's a finance minister. She must have rise the ranks of the SNP with these views. But it's still clearly not compatible with the leadership of that political party. It's just people don't understand. Off they just... I see this all the time. It's like, you, got, you know, the people just don't seem to have an understanding of what democracy and free speech means. Or they go like... Um, well, she's got these personal views. Why does it matter? Well, firstly, she's come out saying she wants exemptions for religious institutions on... on on conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is torture against okay, LGBTQ people. But what, uh, it's not exactly many institutions that aren't religious that are going to do conversion therapy or based on the person consenting, in, in quotes, to that so-called conversion therapy. The vast majority of people who do conversion therapy consent. That's because they've been brought up to have views which make them um, reject who they really are. I mean, that's part of the problem. Uh, you're not, so, you know, abuse is often, often based on supposed consent. I'm sorry to have to explain how abuse works to people. Um, obviously, people have ended up essentially brainwashed into thinking that their sexual orientation is horribly sinful and that they therefore are convinced and persuaded into thinking they need rescuing and that they can be so, so you know, cured. They can't be cured. Nothing they can do about it. That's who they are. So what you're doing is just inflicting torture on someone. Now, She's, you know, so she clearly can't be trusted to advance the rights of LGBTQ people. If you don't have people in positions of power who proactively are there to support minorities who face rising hate crimes, and there's surging anti-LGBTQ hate crimes in Scotland at the moment, partly because of the anti-trans um, freak show, frankly, which is going on at the moment, just a load of increasingly zealous extremists online with no one to stop them. I mean, they are like anti-vaxxers, but with respectability. With anti-vaxxers, if you go down that whole rabbit hole, people are a bit like, and the media's like, oh, a bit weird. But with the anti-trans stuff, you can say what you want. Basically, just go off on a massive rampage, say what you want about trans people, and you get very, very little pushback. And, you know, that has had consequences, not just for trans people who are overwhelmingly the victim, but for more LGBTQ people more generally. Of course it does. Um, and if you don't have someone... Oh, I see. I stopped there. Didn't what happened to my internet. Presumably the anti-trans movement trying to shut me down. If you don't have people in positions of power who can stand up for LGBTQ people, then things will go backwards. 
And that's why it's important that she doesn't win. But she's not going to win anyway. <laughs> um, because she's blown up her campaign. So, and that's... I was going to say that's sad. It isn't. It's actually quite funny, if I'm honest. It's funny. People are going to make complete fools of themselves, um, which she has, because she, her entire campaign launch um, consists of her making fundamentalist Christian comments about various social issues. Well, anyway, um, oh, someone here saying she'll make a fantastic first minister. Well, she won't make a fantastic first minister, I'm afraid to say, uh, to that person in the comments, because she's not going to become first minister of Scotland, because she's not going to be voted for. In fact, she's a laughingstock. Her campaign's a laughingstock. There's no way members of the SNP are going to vote for this person. If they did, they will plunge the SNP into a very horrible and brutal civil war, which will rip the SNP apart and make an independent Scotland, in any case, completely impossible. So what's the point of that? <laughs> I mean, look, I'm not an SNP guy. I don't support Scottish independence for a start. I think it's up to Scotland if they vote for independence. Um, but, you know, someone's saying, she, you know, she's passionate about Scotland. Well, what? I mean, I'm sure she is. She's not, pa she's not passionate about the equality of all Scottish people, though, is she? <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? She doesn't think that all citizens in her heart of hearts deserve equal rights. She wouldn't vote for equal rights for LGBTQ people if that was on the agenda. Um, and she wouldn't vote to properly ban conversion therapy. So she's not suitable um, to be first minister. She just wouldn't have... She's not. Anyway, look, she's not going to win. She's blown herself up. Um, and, you know, someone's saying if equality isn't your priority as a national leader, you shouldn't be a national leader. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of national leaders don't think that. But yes, you're right in the abstract. Um, but, in, you know, it's supposed to be a centre-left party. She clearly isn't coming from a centre-left perspective. Um, so I was asking about Hamza Youssef, who's standing as well, who did vote in, I think, two of the votes on equal marriage in support, missed one of them because he had an important meeting on honour killings in Pakistan. Completely legitimate reason, but has said repeatedly he supports equal marriage. That's different from Kate Forbes, who says she wouldn't have voted and supported equal marriage. Um, and it is notable that, given the Islamophobic hysteria as well, <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of hysterias, um, that you get two prominent Muslim politicians, um, Humza there, and also Sadiq Khan, Mayor of London, who stand up for LGBTQ rights. And you've got a load of, frankly, you know, a load of Christian, mostly Tories, who don't. Where's that leave us? So, yeah, anyway, ran over there. Um, thanks for doing this impromptu thing with us. It was very impromptu. And we did it at the same time in Navarra, so it was a bit of a disaster in that sense. But, you know, what the hell? We did a live... Um, and we will do it live this weekend. It may well be on Saturday, the live I do, because I'm interviewing Bernie Sanders live in Oxford um, at the Oxford Playhouse. It's sold out. You can get tickets on, to watch it online, though. Anyway, so I'm doing that on Sunday, so it's not a good idea for me to do a show on Sunday. So I'll probably do it on Saturday, which I'm looking forward to. Um, and we've got loads of videos tomorrow and throughout the week, as we keep doing. Um, thank you to uh, State Daft, to... Um, Mass to David Bowater uh, and to Tad Cantwell. Thanks for joining this very impromptu little live. It's a mini live, but you know, an important live. And it is important we talk about the rise of fascism because fascism is being stoked. It's a violent menace being encouraged by the right wing media, um, by uh, the British government, and also by anti trans and anti LGBTQ activists. Yeah, they're all they're all piling in together. Those agitating gates, refugees, migrants, all the rest of it. It's all coming together and it's so important that we stand against it because people have been killed and attacked by this menace. And if we don't stand by each other um, and not be picked off one by one, um, then that help will help lay the foundations, particularly in a period of economic and social trauma for the rise of far right extremists. So it's very, very important. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It has been an honour um, as always. And what was I going to say? OK, yeah. So just quickly on. Saturday, I think I'm going to do this on Saturday, and we've got loads of stuff. Do support us on patreon.com forward slash Owen Jones 84 if you can. And press like before you go, press subscribe, listen to us on the podcast as well. Um, that's it. See you in a bit, guys. <laughs> <laughs>